What is up, everybody? In today's video, we're going to talk about the art of interviewing. If you're new to the channel, I'm Phil Tabor, a physicist, former semiconductor engineer, turned machine learning practitioner. I'm going to give you my top tips for how to pass an interview, how to get the job, and get started on the career of your dreams. Let's get started. So this video is motivated by a question from a subscriber on my previous video on the art of learning. He said, Phil, this method works really well for learning, but what happens when you go to a job interview and they ask all, so all sorts of stuff outside the scope of the job title, the job uh, description? What do you do then since the learning just-in-time method may not prepare you for that? Well, I do have some points to address that. So uh, first of all, there, uh, this is something you should expect. The point of the interview is to find the limits of your knowledge. And rest assured, the people interviewing you, unless you're an industry veteran, you've been, you know, if you've had several jobs before, um, unless that's the case, the people interviewing you are going to know more than you do, almost certainly. And it's part of their job to find the limits of your knowledge. So you need to expect that at a certain point, they're going to ask a question you don't have the answer for. And they're going to keep probing until they hit that point. And the reason they do is because they don't want to know what you know. Uh, what is the purpose of the interview? Nobody gets paid to regurgitate knowledge. People get paid to solve problems, which really goes to the heart of my previous video where we talked about learning by problem solving uh, and looking up information just in time. So the point of asking these questions at the limit of your knowledge is, is to see how you handle situations in which you don't know the actual answer. And it's important to be upfront and honest about that and say, you know, uh, that's a great question. It's not something I know off the top of my head, but here is how I think about that. This is my thought process. This is how I would solve the problem. And then you want to guide the interviewers through your thought process so they can see that you're not some vegetable that can't solve problems. Uh, but rest assured, you will be asked things that you do not know the answer to. Uh, it is almost a certainty. Second thing is that the uh, just-in-time learning method absolutely applies to job interviews. When you're applying to the job, you see the requirements in the job listing. Now, I do not think that you should not apply if you don't meet all the requirements. In other words, go ahead and apply even if you don't have all the requirements. You never know. So the hiring manager for that job may or may not be a technical person. The larger the company, the less likely it is a technical person that's actually doing the hiring. And they are probably just coming up with some type of laundry list, some wish list of the ideal candidate. And almost nobody's going to fit that bill. You know, 10 years of experience uh, uh, with just out of college, right? It's, it's not going to happen. So don't be intimidated by the requirements. And if you don't know the, uh, everything on the the job, uh, job listing, go ahead and apply anyway. But do not, under any circumstances, Pad your resume with stuff you do not know. And the reason you don't want to do this is because they will almost certainly ask you about the stuff on your resume. So interviews typically come in a couple phases. The first phase is usually like a phone interview, so the company knows whether or not they want to spend more time in, in going down the process with you. And that phone interview will typically uh, be by a lower level member or maybe a lower level manager in the organization. They're going to ask you questions directly related to what's on your resume. And the reason they do this is because they want to weed out all of the liars and the morons first. Uh, and only uh, It's kind of a moronic move to put something on your resume you don't know intimately and inside and out. I actually got tripped up with this when I was applying to Intel uh, at the end of my tenure as a graduate student. So I had worked on a number of projects through my PhD, and I was one of the rare students that started working in a lab pretty much right away. I think at the end of my first year, I started working in the lab. I wanted to get publishing papers doing hands-on type stuff first. I've never been really big in, in coursework. I don't like taking tests. I don't like studying. I like doing actual stuff, you know, producing actual results. And so I started working in the lab right away and had papers relatively quickly. I was the first in my class to publish. The concept that was awesome at the time, but the consequence of that is towards the end of my PhD, PhD tenure, I'd forgotten a lot of the stuff I'd done at the beginning. And on one of my phone interviews, naturally I'd put all of my papers, but I was asked several very detailed technical questions that were directly in the paper. We had cited some of the stuff we did in the paper and I'd forgotten all about it. I hadn't reread my own papers. It didn't even occur to me. Why would I do that, right? Uh, but that, that kind of whacked me out of the pool of candidates for the next phase of the job because I was an idiot. I was stupid and didn't know everything intimately on my resume. Now, of course, I knew the physics behind what we had accomplished, but this was a job for process engineering. They didn't really care about physics. They cared about, hey, you talked about spectrum analyzers. We know what kind of settings did you use? I don't know. This was three or four years ago. I've forgotten. Uh, did not go well. Quite humiliating. So moral of that story is make 
Sure, you know everything on your resume inside and out, even old stuff that you think they're not going to ask about because they may, and Murphy's Law is that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So how does just-in-time learning apply to the interview process? Well, you read the job description, you say, hmm, uh, I, you go down the list, you say, well, you know, some of this stuff I could learn, let's say another programming language, let's say it's for a machine learning job, they do both R and Python, and you're predominantly a Python programmer, maybe you could do a quick couple of projects in R and stick it up on your GitHub. Uh, then you don't necessarily have to put it on your resume, but if the topic comes up in the interview, you can say, well, I did XYZ project. They're kind of small. I'm mostly a Python programmer, but I do know a little bit about R, you know, or whatever other package, whatever other thing, SQL, perhaps if you're not a SQL person, whatever it is, you can apply just-in-time learning to the concept of, to the uh, situation of interviews as well. Um, and you should expect that uh, you're not going to know everything for the job. So don't feel like just because the job description lists 50 different things that you should know all 50 of those things because really nobody is going to. They they really want to find uh, people that know enough to get started and people that are capable of solving problems, which if you follow my advice on just-in-time learning, you'll become an expert in problem solving. And that's really what you're shooting for. You're not shooting for expertise in a platform, framework, language. You're shooting for expertise in solving problems. Um, another tip I have for you is to get comfortable with ambiguity. So when you're in the workplace, now, you know, if you've if you have a job, you're probably already familiar with this. Uh, you're usually given vague requirements. You know, management may want one thing, the business unit may want something, but it's not really fleshed out. And they don't always ask software engineers opinions on it, right? Because you're just a lowly plebeian peasant programmer. What the hell do you know? Uh, they, they talk to the customer and develop requirements without necessarily talking to the software developers or the machine learning engineers. So uh, you may have to deal with a lot of ambiguity and this can manifest itself in the job interview. Um, uh, there were a number of questions when I interviewed, when I got the on-site interview at Intel in New Mexico, they asked a number of questions that were deliberately ambiguous. They worded them in ways that have multiple interpretations. And this was for a process engineering gig. Uh, so there was a lot of questions related to uh, process flow, like how would you diagnose issues, and they wouldn't give you some bits of information, so you had to insert assumptions and explain those assumptions along the way. So get comfortable with ambiguity because they're going to throw it at you in the interview process, and they're going to also uh, throw it at you in the workplace. Everything you do, if it's worth doing, is going to be a novel problem and is going to be um, at the cutting edge of what is being of what is known, and you're not going to be able to go find a whole lot of samples for the core logic of it online to guide you through the process. Another thing, another tip I have is uh, to be comfortable uh, coding in front of other people. Now, I don't know. I haven't done any machine learning corporate interviews. I do freelance machine learning work, so the interviews are a little bit different. Typically, I'm interviewing with someone who is the business owner, and they only know a little bit, and I have to guide them toward a solution to the problem. So it's a little bit different, but it's not a stretch of the imagination to think that for a job in which you're going to be doing a lot of coding, that you're going to have to do a coding exercise. Now, it may not be the same as with software engineers where you have to do algorithmic type stuff, but you need to be prepared to do coding in front of people. Uh, it reminds me of when I was in grad school, we had a professor, R. Weldon, who would uh, make students uh, take exams. We had in-class exams, which was unheard of for physics. Almost always you took an exam home and worked on it over the weekend. He did in-class exams. And uh, they were designed in such a way that they got to the heart of the problem. And if you were doing pages and pages of calculations, you screwed up and you missed the point of the problem. Uh, and when he was asked about this in class, he said, hey, Professor Weldon, why do we have in-class exams? You know, this really sucks for us. He said, well, you know, if you want to get a job doing this, if you want somebody to pay you You've got to know something, right? You've got to know something. And you can't always go grab a freaking reference to know something, right? You have to demonstrate that you have an intimate and solid grasp of the fundamentals of your field. So I think this addresses the main point of what the uh, what Rocky Liang, the, the uh, viewer, was asking. Uh, you know, they're going to ask you stuff that is at the limits of your knowledge. If you merely focus on solving individual problems, how is it that you can know all of the fundamentals? Uh, so my next tip would be actually know the fundamentals. Um, go ahead and consume resources on uh, concepts, but they should be done in parallel with the problem solving process. So if you spend a significant amount of time learning about the fundamentals before you actually go out and try to apply them, then you suffer the same issue you do in a college course where you have to go back and learn them all the time. 
uh, right before you need them. So you should be learning fundamentals in tandem with specifics of a particular topic or perhaps a little bit before. Uh, if you are coming from a university background where you have courses, then, you know, you've already covered the fundamentals, just study them. You know, it's not my preferred way of learning, but it kind of works and it'll work to get you through a job interview anyway. So there is some merit there. Uh, but just keep in mind that you do need to know fundamentals and that <laughs> and the uh, just-in-time problem solving applies to that as well. You can look stuff up as you need it as you come across a concept you don't understand. Um, so other tips uh, would be to ask a ton of questions. So this is something that uh, people don't necessarily do. They feel kind of intimidated. Uh, they'll usually save your questions for the end by the time you're kind of drained. But the secret to that is going to be to write down questions beforehand. You want to have a series of good questions. Don't ask, you know, uh, don't ask questions. I should talk about that. Questions not to ask. Uh, one other way I screwed myself in the job interview was asking if I could, uh, if there was any room for lateral movement or vertical movement. The people interviewing you don't want to know that you're thinking about taking another job within, you know, the next year or two. They want to, you know, they want to think that you're in the in the position for the long haul. That you're going to be a valued member of the team. You're going to develop that tribal knowledge and really contribute to the success of the team. So don't tip them off that you're planning on. Uh, moving into a different position or another part of the company right off the bat. So don't ask about um, lateral transfer opportunities. You can't ask about accepting more responsibility, vertical opportunities. People like it when uh, people come along and take on more responsibility because it means less work for them usually. Uh, people always like leaders as long as you're not, uh, not a total douchebag about it. So uh, it's a good idea to ask about accepting more responsibility, how you can grow in the position. Um, it's also a good idea to ask about technical details of the solution if they're allowed to discuss any of that. So a lot of times you uh, may not know a whole lot about the project beforehand because it's kind of vague. I did a um, interview for a machine learning freelance position for a marketing startup that was doing uh, they wanted to build out an AI system to do management of digital marketing, and their website was rather vague because it was all in you know the development phase. So they didn't really have a set of requirements, that ambiguity again. So during the interview process, I wasn't really able to um, wasn't really able to ask too many detailed technical questions because there was not a whole lot to go on. But you always want to ask questions that get to the heart of the problem. Uh, that show that you can do problem solving and kind of get to the heart of the matter. That's always impressive to the company. Uh, it's also important to ask about uh, like fit. That's kind of one of the things that they hire on is do they think you're going to be someone they want to work with, right? So uh, that's another thing to talk about. Don't come into the interview acting all cocky. You want to be confident. You want to be project an air of competence and confidence, but you don't want to be cocky. You need to recognize that even if you have a PhD and these people are only bachelor's degree people, uh, uh, engineers, that you probably don't know more than they do. You may think the PhD grants you magical knowledge and special powers, but it does not, I guarantee you. And there is a negative stereotype associated with PhDs often being educated idiots, and that uh, is well-deserved and for good reason. It's often true, uh, but you want to, if you have a PhD, you especially want to counteract that particular perception of you. You want to... Um, give deference and have a little bit of humility, but when you speak, make sure you speak with confidence. You don't want to, people can smell blood. If you, if you, uh, if your confidence in what you're saying wavers, then they will pounce. They'll keep probing and probing until you finally break down. So it's better to say things, if you're going to say something wrong, it's better to say the wrong thing confidently than to say the right thing uh, sheepishly, you know, with meek, meekness in your voice, no real confidence about it. Uh, if you're going to be wrong, go all the way, be wrong, and say it confidently. And if they correct you, don't uh, double down on being wrong, uh, you know, accept the correction, uh, but, you know, always speak with confidence and some degree of authority, given that you understand to give some kind of deference to the people interviewing you because they are, you know, probably more senior, more expert than you are. So there you have it. Those are my top tips. Uh, you can apply just-in-time learning to interviews, meaning you can do little work, little projects on stuff on the um, on the project, on the job listing before you apply just to get something on your GitHub. Don't uh, think that just because you don't have everything, you can't apply. Make sure you know everything on your resume. Uh, expect that they're going to find the limits of your knowledge, and they do that because they want to see your ability to solve problems. Learn to accept ambiguity and deal with that in both the workplace and the interview process, uh, and have good decorum during the interview. Speak with confidence. Um, project 
an air of someone they want to work with, someone that is going to be a valued member of the team. And whatever you do, do not speak about uh, taking on different positions within the company. I hope that is helpful for you. If it is, make sure to leave a comment, subscribe, hit the bell icon, because I know that only 13% of you are uh, receiving notifications for this. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next video.